Shalom, everybody. God bless you, and thank you so much for hanging in there with us. Uh, I'm Pastor Scott Delane with Holy Impact Ministries, and we'd like to thank everybody out there for joining us for our Wednesday night Bible study night. Uh, it has been a little bit of a difficult uh, time trying to get online here. Uh, Vimeo said that we were casting from somewhere else, uh, apparently, and uh, so we had to fix that, and I think things are up and running now. I think we're okay, and uh, we'll have to check into that and see what that was all about, but uh, once again, my friends, uh, it is always a good idea to uh, check everything and just to make sure that uh, uh, there's nobody coming in through the back door during these days uh, with our electronic equipment. But with that being said, thank you for being patient and thank you for sticking with us this evening. It is a blessing to be with you. We're going to be moving into Leviticus chapter 11 this evening. And we've got a great study for you this evening. Uh, may go a little bit long in the tooth this evening because there is a lot to talk about concerning whether or not a Christian today, a modern-day Christian, can actually eat what is considered unclean animals and food according to our God-breathed Scripture. We're going to talk about that this evening, and we're going to talk a little bit about, again, why it's so important for a modern-day Christian to read the Bible from the beginning of the book and not just from the middle of the book and some of the traps and the snares that we are oftentimes ensnared in because Many of our brothers and sisters have chosen to only read the book from the book of Matthew to the book of Revelation instead of reading it from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. So we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today, and uh, I think that uh, everything is going all right. We have excellent connections all the way around. We're just kind of keeping an eye on that to make sure that we are uh, indeed staying up. One thing that I did want to mention uh, here this evening is we are sending out a warning to all Holy Impact Ministries members and especially our members who, uh, again, attend fellowship with us online every Saturday afternoon from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, we have had people come into our fellowship who uh, are very seem to be very nice, and they will come in, they will collect your email, they will collect your phone number and ask you for your phone number and for your contact information, and then they will send you an email trying to sell you things. Uh, my friends, I, I just want you to know and I want you to understand that this is there, there is nobody selling anything that has anything to do with Holy Impact Ministries. We have one individual who is now sending out emails and contacting people trying to sell them land in Kentucky. Uh, Holy Impact Ministries is not affiliated with this individual, and this individual is not affiliated with Holy Impact Ministries, nor are they sponsoring Holy Impact Ministries, nor are we sponsoring them. Uh, again, if you are receiving an email from a man by the name of David who is trying to sell you land in Kentucky, please, my friends, delete the email. Again, delete the email. Uh, this is not from HolyImpactMinistries.com, and we do not advise you to be involved in this. We don't want anybody's family out there being hurt financially. Uh, from people who are coming into the ministry uh, trying to sell things, whether it be other doctrines or land in Kentucky, and especially on the Sabbath. So once again, my friends, this is a warning that is going out. Uh, this will not be the only warning. We have other warnings that will be going out as well. Uh, if you receive any kind of solicitation from anyone who has been in our fellowship uh, or not been in our fellowship, I want you to contact me immediately, or one of our elders. And we will let you know if that person is sanctified and if that person is affiliated with the ministry. Again, uh, this particular person by the name of David, who is selling land in Kentucky, not affiliated with Holy Impact Ministries. And I want to take you over to the website here very quickly, just to keep everybody safe. Uh, if you go over to the website at holyimpactministries.com, this is our website, and over here to the very right of the page, you will find the HIM Elders page right here. All you have to do is click on that, and there are, is all kinds of contact information here. We have all of our elders. You can contact any of our elders and myself included uh, down here. So if you have anybody soliciting you that you think might be from Holy Impact Ministries but you're not sure, please contact one of us. And let us know if you can't get a hold of one of us, please contact the other. We talk to each other almost on a daily basis, and we will be able to advise you as to whether or not this person is affiliated with this ministry. 
And so once again, my friends, it's a shame. It is, a, it is an outright shame that we have to put out these kinds of warnings uh, to people that are coming to fellowship. But again, uh, this is the world that we now live in. And uh, we are told in the book of Jude uh, that ungodly people would indeed come into the ministry and try to turn our Messiah's gospel into lasciviousness. And uh, uh, I can't imagine somebody coming into a Sabbath of fellowship and trying to sell someone something. Uh, we don't sell things, number one, on the Sabbath, and you will find that uh, uh, Holy Impact Ministries has never sold anyone anything on the Sabbath day. And so that's a red flag right there. Uh, but again, my friends, I just want you to be careful. Watch for these kinds of things. When you come into fellowship, uh, we always try to be hospitable to everyone, and we always try to show each person kindness and love. And uh, But we again, we must trust through verification. Be very careful who you give your email to and your phone number to and your contact information to, uh, no matter what fellowship that you go to. Um, there are people that will come into church fellowships and will try to make a buck. And my friends, that is not what the ministry is uh, built for. And uh, we certainly don't do that at Holy Impact Ministries, nor do we condone such things. So with that being said, my friends, just keep your eyes uh, open. And if again, if you hear of anything like that, or if you have received anything like that, please contact me uh, or one of the elders and let us know uh, these things. With that being said, we've got a great uh, study the, uh, this evening, and we're going to move into Leviticus chapter 10. We're going to finish up chapter 10 and move right on into Leviticus chapter 11. And we're going to be talking about whether or not all foods are clean concerning the scripture and what our Father in heaven says. So if you are a modern day Christian and you believe that all things are okay for you to eat and that all animals are clean for you now, uh, I would like you to stick around. And I think that you might, uh, might change your mind by the end of this study. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Leviticus chapter 10 and 11. Welcome back, everybody. The first thing that I'd like to do this evening is just once again to welcome everyone back from our Father's Fall Feast Days. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody, If whether you're at uh, Facebook or YouTube or the Holy Impact Ministries website or Vimeo or LinkedIn or wherever it is that you might be viewing this video from. We just want to say welcome and shalom. And we also want to say a very special welcome and shalom to everybody listening by radio at KMSR 1700 AM. Seldersburg, Indiana. God bless you, everybody. Uh, thank you for welcoming us into your home. And if you get the opportunity, please let the folks know there in Seldersburg at KMSR know that you listen to the station, the radio station there. They would love to hear from you. Uh, so be sure to stop in and just say hello. Uh, with that being said, God bless you, everybody. And again, thank you so very much for being with us. And uh, we've been off for the last couple of weeks because of our Father's Fall Feast Days. 
And we have been following Sukkot and doing many different uh, great wonders and things and listening to testimonials and bonding together. We hope that you've been doing the exact same thing. Uh, it's been, again, a couple of weeks since we've been able to return to our Bible study. And for one, I am excited to get back into the book of Leviticus, which, Leviticus, which is bar none, one of the most instructional books in all of the Bible. And so before we get started here this evening, I'd like to just take the first few minutes of this evening's study to once again explain to some of our new brothers and sisters why it is that we have chosen to go back to the beginning of the book and to read the Bible from the beginning rather than simply reading it from the middle of the book to the end of the book. You know, we talk about it all the time, and we are continuously warning our brothers and sisters over and over and over again out there not to fall for the demonically inspired trick of allowing ourselves to be pre-programmed into thinking that the Bible begins in the book of Matthew. My friends, the Bible does not begin in the book of Matthew. The Bible begins in the book of Genesis. And I can always tell within about 15 minutes of speaking to a brother or to a sister whether or not they have read the Bible from the beginning of the book or from the middle of the book. And it really doesn't take too much time at all to realize when a brother or a sister has forsaken the first 39 books of their Bible because their pastor has conveniently pre-programmed them not to read the first half of the book. As we've said before, now we say again, this is a complete and utter shame for a modern-day Christian. A modern-day Christian today cannot afford to only read half of the book and then think that they know what the book is all about. And I know that many within our congregation already understand how important it is to read the whole book. But the truth of the matter is that the majority of our brothers and sisters who attend any one of over 50,000 different denominational Christian empires really have no idea of how important it is to read the Bible from the beginning of the Bible and not to read it just from the middle. As we will see very clearly here this evening, our Father in Heaven commanded all Christians everywhere to only eat what He has designated as food here on this earth. We will clearly see this evening that our modern day, a modern-day Christian is commanded not to eat what is known as unclean food, according to the Scripture. And there are many reasons why they are commanded not to eat animals that are considered unclean, according to our Father in Heaven. The reason that most modern-day Christians oftentimes ignorantly argue this point is because they are ignorant of the first 39 books of the Bible, because once again their pastors, priests, bishops, and popish leaders have convinced them that the first 39 books of the Bible have all been done away with. If you think that this is okay for a Christian, or if you think that it's okay for a Christian to eat a pig or a crab or lobster because you're pasture says so. I want you to stay tuned throughout this study to the very end, because we're going to minister to you here this evening, and we're going to put some truth in your hearing that you need to hear in order to consider what is going on with this particular practice and what these people are teaching and preaching. Again, my friends, it's important that we put some truth in your hearing so that you can consider before simply following blindly into today's modern-day denominational abyss. We are commanded to study to show ourselves approved, so that we can rightly divide the Word of God. We're not commanded to sit in a church pew for 45 minutes on the wrong day of the week, calling it the Sabbath, while allowing ourselves to be pre-programmed by some man standing behind a pulpit. You simply won't find that nonsense anywhere within the 66 books of your Bible. And it is well past time that we read the book from the beginning so that we can understand what the end of the book is truly trying to teach us and what it's trying to tell us. And as we read the book from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, we will begin to realize that there is no such thing as an Old Testament and a New Testament. Nowhere in the original Hebrew or Greek scripture are we told that there is an Old Testament and a New Testament. There is only one testament, and that is the spoken word of Yahovah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. The Bible is one testament. It is indeed, as Timothy tells us, God breathed. 
with that being said, the first thing that I'd like to do here this evening is to go back and reread Leviticus chapter 10, just to refresh our memories about what we've already talked about in Leviticus chapter 10. Because Leviticus chapter 10 actually leads up into Leviticus chapter 11, which is where we're going to spend most of our time this evening. Before we reread Leviticus chapter 10, we must remember that what we are reading here in the book of Leviticus is about the wilderness tabernacle being put into service. In the book of Exodus, we started to hear about the wilderness tabernacle that Yahovah wanted built exactly as the tabernacle that stands in heaven. And Yahovah gave Moses the instructions to not only build the wilderness tabernacle, but to also put the wilderness tabernacle into service here on earth. And so this is what we're reading about in the book of Leviticus. Moses is now ordaining Aaron as the high priest and his sons as the Levitical priesthood, and he is now consecrating the new wilderness tabernacle and putting it into service. With that in mind, let's begin by rereading Leviticus chapter 10 so that we can remember exactly what it does say, and just as importantly, what it does not say. And we're going to go over to Eastward, which is our favorite uh, Bible application here, and we're going to just read through Leviticus chapter 10. Let's read it together. Starting with Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now Nadab, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before Yahovah, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before Yahovah and consumed them. and They died before Yahovah. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what Yahovah has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry your brothers away from the front of the sanctuary and out of the camp. So they came near, and they carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons, Do not let the hair of your heads hang loose, and do not tear your clothes, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the congregation. But let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning that Yahuwah has kindled. And do not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of Yahuwah is upon you. And they did, they did according to the word of Moses. And Yahuwah spoke to Aaron, saying, Drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, and between the unclean and the clean. And you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that Yahuwah has spoken to them by Moses. Moses spoke to Aaron and Eleazar and Ithamar, his surviving sons. Take the grain offering that is left of Yahuwah's food offerings and eat it unleavened beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place, because it is your due and your son's due from Yahuwah's food offerings, for so I am commanded. But the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed, you shall eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you. For they are given as your due and your sons do from the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the people of Israel. The thigh that is contributed and the breast that is waved, they shall bring uh, with the food offerings of the fat pieces to wave for a wave offering before Yahovah. And it shall be yours and your sons with you as do forever, as Yahovah has commanded. Now Moses diligently inquired about the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burned up. And he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the surviving sons of Aaron, saying, Why have you not eaten the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary, since it is a thing most holy and has been given to you, that you may bear the iniquity of the congregation to make atonement for them before Yahovah? Behold, its blood was not brought into the inner part of the sanctuary. You certainly ought to have eaten it in the sanctuary as I commanded. And Aaron said to Moses, Behold, today... They have offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before Yahovah, and yet such things as these have happened to me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would Yahovah have approved? And when Moses heard it, and when Moses heard that, he approved. 
What we can learn from Leviticus chapter 10 is why it is that we should sanctify our Heavenly Father and glorify Him as He commands us to do. Our Father in Heaven does not want to be worshipped the way that we want to worship Him. Our Father in Heaven does not want to be worshipped the way that we think that He should be. Our Father in Heaven wants to be worshipped the way that He wants to be worshipped. The sons of Aaron, the Dab and Abihu, offered unauthorized fire before Yahovah, which he had not commanded them to do. They took it upon themselves to do as they chose, rather than to do as Yahovah had commanded them. And there are some who believe when they read this scripture that Nadab and Abihu may have had something to drink before they went into the temple area. And again, this is forbidden by Yahovah. And we many people think that because we see uh, Yahovah in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 9, telling them, uh, drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And again, Yahovah reminds Aaron of this. So there is this little bit of a hint that uh, Nadab and Abihu may have been drinking before they went into uh, the tent of meeting, and that could very well be why they did this. And what they did, again, they did in front of the whole house of Israel. And so we can't only imagine why, why Yahovah did what he did in executing them right there. By bringing unauthorized fire before Yahovah, Nadab and Abihu were not glorifying the Elohim of Israel the way they were glorifying themselves because they were doing what pleased them rather than what they were commanded to do in service to Yahovah. Or they, once again, were drinking and were not thinking about what they were doing. Either way, what they were doing was not what Yahovah commanded, and they were doing this in front of the whole house of Israel. And that, my friends, is called covetousness and vanity. And when we allow our own covetousness and vanity to become before the sanctification and the glorification of our Elohim, we are guilty of sin, which is the transgression of his spoken word. And there was no way that Yahuwah could have allowed this evil thing to be done in front of all of the house of Israel. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 clearly tells us that judgment begins with the household of God. James said in James 3.1, we who teach shall be judged with greater strictness. And Yeshua said in Luke 12, 48, Everyone to whom much is given, of him will much be required. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 tells us, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We are called to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Does anyone recall the commandment, come out of her, my people? This is a pretty wildly known uh, commandment that we hear in the book of Revelation. That concept is not only found in the book of Revelation. That commandment, just like so many quotes and commandments that we find in the New Testament, comes directly from the Old Testament. The commandment to go out of the midst of her, my people, comes from Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 45. And it is later quoted in Revelation chapter 18. But I want us to listen to the whole verse found in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 45. Let's go read that for ourselves. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 44 and 45 says this, And I will punish Bel in Babylon and take out of his mouth what he has swallowed. The nations shall no longer flow to him. The wall of Babylon has fallen. Go out of the midst of her, my people. Let everyone save his life from the fierce anger of Yahovah. And again, contrast this with what we find in Revelation chapter 18, verses 4 and 5. It says, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Again, speaking of Babylon. 
God's anger and his wrath is going to rain down upon the ungodly of this earth. And any nation or congregation that has decided to place their faith in the doctrines of men instead of the word of God is going to be subject to that anger. Jeremiah warns us to run from it. The book of Revelation and John tells us to come out of that. The question that I have for us all today is, are we listening? With that being said, let's now move into Leviticus chapter 11, and let's read it for ourselves so that we can know exactly what it says, and just as importantly, what it does not say. So let's go over to Leviticus chapter 11, moving forward, and let's read Leviticus chapter 11, see what it has to say. It says this, and again, this is during the initiation of the priesthood and putting the wilderness tabernacle into service, starting with Leviticus Chapter 11, verse 1. It says, And Yahovah spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, These are the living things that you may eat among all animals that are on the earth. Whatever parts of the hoof and is cloven footed and choose the cud among the animals you may eat. Nevertheless, among those that chew the cud or part the hoof, you shall not eat these. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, is unclean for you. The rock badger, because it chews the cud, but does not part the hoof, is unclean for you. And the hare, because it chews the cud, but does not part the hoof, is unclean for to you. And the pig, because it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed, but does not chew the cud, is unclean for you. You shall not eat any of their flesh, and you shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. Everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whether it's in the seas or the rivers, you may eat. But anything in the seas or the rivers that does not have fins and scales, of the swarming creatures in the waters and of the living creatures that are in the waters, is detestable to you. You shall regard them as detestable. You shall not eat any of their flesh, and you shall detest their carcasses. Everything in the waters that does not have fins and scales is detestable to you. And these you shall detest among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are detestable. The eagle, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the nighthawk, the seagull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl, the cormorant, the short-eared owl, the barn owl, the tawny owl, the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron of any kind, the hopi, and the bat, all winged insects that go on all fours are detestable to you. Yet among the winged insects that go on all fours, you may eat those that have jointed legs above their feet, with which to hop on the ground. Of them you may eat the locust of any kind, the bald locust of any kind, the cricket of any kind, and the grasshopper of any kind. But all other winged insects that have four feet are detestable to you. And by these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches their carcasses shall become unclean until the even. And whoever carries any part of their carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Every animal that parts the hoof but is not cloven-footed or does not chew the cud is unclean for you. Everyone who touches them shall be unclean. And all that walk on their paws among the animals that go on all fours are unclean to you. Whoever touches their carcasses shall be unclean until the evening. And who carries their carcasses shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. They're unclean to you. And these are unclean to you among the swarming things that swarm on the ground, the mole rat, the mouse, the great lizard of any kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the lizard, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among that swarm. Whoever touches them, they are dead. When they are dead, shall be unclean until the evening. And anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean. Whether it is an article of wood or a garment or a skin or a sack, any article that is used for any purpose, it must be put into water and it must be unclean until the evening when it shall be clean. And if any of them falls into any earthenware vessel, all that is in it shall be unclean, and you shall break it. 
Any food in it that could be eaten on which water comes shall be unclean. And all drink that could be drunk from every such vessel shall be unclean. And everything on which any part of their carcass falls shall be unclean. Whether oven or stove, it shall be broken in pieces. They are unclean and shall remain unclean for you. Nevertheless, a spring or cistern holding water shall be clean. But whoever touches a carcass in them shall be unclean. And if any part of their carcass falls upon any seed grain that is to be sown, it is clean. But if water is put on the seed and any part of their carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. And if any animal which you may eat dies, whoever touches its carcass shall be unclean until the evening. And whoever eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. And whoever carries the carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Every swarming thing that swarms on the ground is detestable. It shall not be eaten. Whatever goes on its belly and whatever goes on all fours or whatever has many feet, any swarming thing that swarms on the ground, you shall not eat for they are detestable. You shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarms, and you shall not defile yourselves with them and become unclean through them. For I am Yahovah your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am Yahovah who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law about the beasts and bird and every living creature that moves through the waters and every creature that swarms on the ground, to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the living creature that may be eaten and the living creature that may not be eaten. Now, one of the first things that I want us to pay attention here to is why Yahovah commands us not to eat these certain things. He says, it is because he is holy, and we also are to be holy. And that is the reason that he gives here in 11, uh, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. He says, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am Yahovah, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy. Why? For I am holy, that's why. Okay, so I want us to grasp this understanding of clean and unclean foods. What is it that makes us unholy? Doing things that Yahovah says not to do. Touching things that Yahovah says not to touch. Playing with things that Yahovah tells us not to play with. And so this is extremely important for us to understand. And so here we have the God-given commandment concerning what food is and what food is not. And it's important that we make this distinction because today in our time, there are denominational charters of men who will proud, uh, proudfully and yet shamefully proclaim that a modern-day Christian can eat whatever he or she pleases, which basically puts them in the same category as Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu who were struck down by Yahovah for blatantly rejecting his spoken word in front of the whole house of Israel. The first thing that I'd like us to do is to highlight Leviticus chapter 11, verse 2. And I want us to go back over and I want us to take a look at that. Please, my friends, highlight Leviticus chapter 11, verse 2, where it says, and I quote, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, these are the living things that you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Now, my friends, this is a direct commandment that comes from the creator of the heavens and the earth who created all living things upon the earth. Some animals, just like plants, are considered food for human beings. Other animals are created to be the vacuum cleaners of the earth. Pigs and crustacean, like crabs and lobsters, were created to remove the toxins from the earth in order to keep the earth free from toxins and pollutants that could kill human beings. Crabs and lobsters are like the vultures of the sea. They eat the dung of fish off the ocean floor and the dead and the dying bodies of whatever lies on the bottom of the sea. 
Pigs were never meant to be eaten by human beings, according to our God-breathed scripture. Nowhere within the confines of the 66 books of our Bibles do we ever find anyone who is a Jew or a Christian eating pig. The consumption of pig is an abomination to the creator of the heavens and the earth. It always has been, and it always will be. People who eat what are known as unclean animals oftentimes wind up sick and dying from things like cancer and blood disorders and pancreatic and liver problems because they are consuming the toxins of the earth that were never meant to be consumed. God did not create these living creatures to be consumed by a human being. However, today's modern-day church, by and large, proudly and yet shamefully proclaims that all animals are considered food in the eyes of God, that they say that they serve. And we're going to take a look at some of the scripture that they use wrongfully and shamefully to sell the snake oil that they wrongfully and shamefully sell the public. But before we do that, I want us to also know that the 11th chapter of the book of Leviticus is closely paralleled in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 3 through 21. So let's go to Deuteronomy very quickly, and I want us to just see exactly what it is that is paralleled to Leviticus chapter uh, 11. So let's go take a look at that very quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 14, and we're just going to read verses 3 through 21. It says this, You shall not eat any abomination. These are the animals you may eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. Every animal that parts the hoof and has the hoof cloven in two and chews the cud among the animals you may eat. Yet of those that chew the cud or have the hoof cloven, you shall not eat these, the camel, the hare, the rock badger, because they chew the cud but do not part the hoof, are unclean for you. And the pig, because it parts the hoof, but does not chew the cud. It's unclean for you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. And again, a carcass is a dead, a dead body, so you shall not touch the dead body of a pig. Of all that are in the waters, you may eat these. Whatever has fins and scales, you may eat. Whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It's unclean for you. You may eat all clean birds. But these are the ones that you shall not eat, the eagle, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the nighthawk, the sea gull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl, and the short-eared owl, the barn owl, and the tawny owl, the carrion vulture, and the cormorant, the stork, the heron of any kind, the hoopy, and the bat. And all winged insects are unclean for you. They shall not be eaten. All clean winged things you may eat. You shall not eat anything that is died naturally. You may give it to the sojourner who is within your towns, that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a people holy to Yahovah your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And so we see some very interesting things here in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Now, I want to just very quickly before we move forward, I want to just touch on Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 21, where it says that you may give it to a traveler who's within your towns that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. That does not include foreigners and Gentiles who have been grafted into the house of Israel. Let me say that again. That does not include Gentiles that have been grafted into the house of Israel. There were many people that were sojourning with the house of Israel. You have to remember, there were over 2 million people that had come out of Egypt. And they were, and all of the surrounding nations, as the Israelites would pass through, would, would sell things to them and make things for them. That's how they made their living. But not all of them became grafted into the house of Israel. There was only one way to become grafted into the house of Israel, and that was what, by being circumcised. If a Gentile chose to have his family circumcised and to do as the Israelites did, he was then seen as a native of the land. This is just simply a traveler who is traveling with them. If this person is a Gentile travel, traveler who has not been circumcised, doesn't plan on being circumcised, uh, he, you can give this, uh, these unclean things to them. They can eat them. But, but listen to what it says here in Deuteronomy 14.21. It says, you are a holy people that is holy to Yahovah your God. 
And that's why you're not allowed to do these things. This is, again, a sign between our Father in heaven and us, those who belong to him. And this is very important for us to understand. Another thing that I'd like to do in Deuteronomy chapter 14 is to highlight Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 3. Because this, again, is uh, very important, where it tells us that we are commanded not to eat any abominable thing. The English word abominable comes from the Hebrew word tuba, which means disgusting thing or something that is unclean for a believer. In the ethical sense, it means something wicked or something that is in an abhorrence to Yahovah. By and large, the animals acceptable for human consumption are those that chew the cud and split the hoof. Not one or the other, but both. They must both have a split hoof and chew the cud, which is the grass of the field. When talking about aquatic animals, only creatures with fins and scales are permitted to be eaten. Birds and insects are also covered in these instructions. And something else that I might make mention of is that this spoken word of God which is what the law of God is, was known clear back in the days of Noah in the beginning of the book of Genesis. Once again, today's modern-day church, by and large, teaches that Noah only brought two of every kind of animal into the ark. This, once again, is another deception that most modern-day Christians have no concept of because they have been pre-programmed not to read the beginning of the book. Let's turn very quickly to Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And this is very important for us to see. Again, we're going to turn back to the book of Genesis. And again, the book of Genesis is the first book in the Bible. And it says this. Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Then Yahovah said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, I want you to highlight that in your Bible, my friends. Genesis 7, 2. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and its mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all of the earth. Notice here in Genesis chapter 7, verse 2 that Noah was told to take seven pairs of all clean animals into the ark and only one pair of the unclean animals into the ark. I find it ironic that today's modern-day Christian concerns themselves more with the unclean than they do the clean. Today's modern-day Christian churches teach their children about the unclean animals that Noah took into the ark, while once again completely ignoring the clean animals that Noah took into the ark and why it was that Yahuwah commanded Noah to take seven pairs of clean animals, while only two pairs of the unclean animals. Yahuwah commanded Noah to take seven pairs of all clean animals into the ark because he knew that the clean animals were going to be used for both food and for ritual sacrifice, while the unclean animals would not be used for anything other than repopulating the earth in order to keep the earth free from toxins and the poisons of the earth. And I want us to understand that this spoken word of Yahovah does not change. Our Father is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We do not see the law being given to the house of Israel until we get into the book of Exodus when we read the Bible. But clearly, what Yahovah was laying forth as his law was given way back before the book of Exodus or the book of Leviticus. The law, his spoken word, the spoken word of Yahovah, was already known by Noah and his family back in the book of Genesis from the very beginning of creation. Noah was very well aware of what animals were clean and what animals were not clean. Therefore, what we see being instituted in the book of Exodus and Leviticus is simply the spoken word of Yahovah that Yahovah had spoken from the very beginning of creation. Yahovah was simply reinstituting what he had already made known to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We must remember that it is written that Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden. What is sin according to the Bible? 
the, the biblical definition of sin is the transgression of the spoken word of Yahovah, which is the law. If there was no law to transgress, then Adam and Eve could not have sinned. Once again, we must understand the biblical definition of sin according to Scripture. Let's turn to the New Testament in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says this, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is, my friend. According to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, the biblical definition of sin is the transgression of the law. And what is the law? The law is the spoken word of Yahovah, also known as his Torah. Let's very quickly turn to Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. Once again, real quick, I just want to go to Exodus, and I just want to show you this. Very important. Most Christians, again, don't know this. We want to make sure that they do. And again, we are in Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. I want to read this to you. And I want to read 49 as well. Exodus chapter 12, verses 48 and 49. It says this, If a stranger, and a stranger again is a Gentile, my friends, a stranger is someone who is not born by blood into the house of Israel. Listen to this. If a Gentile, you can replace that word stranger with Gentile if you like, they're the same. If a Gentile shall sojourn or travel with you and would keep the Passover to Yahovah, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land. My friends, I want you to highlight that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. That Gentile who is circumcised because he wants to keep the Passover becomes a native of the land. He shall be as a native of the land in the eyes of Yahovah. Were the Gentiles being grafted into the house of Israel clear back in the beginning of the Bible? Yes, my friends. Right here it is. Not says I, but says our God breathed scripture. Let's read it again. Exodus 12, 48. If a stranger, a Gentile, shall sojourn, travel with you, and would keep the Passover to Yahovah, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land. But, but, no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Now listen to this in verse 49, Exodus chapter 12, verse 49. There shall be one law for the native and for the Gentile stranger who travels among you. How many laws? Are there two laws, one for the Jew, one for the Gentile? No, you won't find that nonsense anywhere within the confines of the 66 books of your Bible. Here in Exodus chapter 12, we can clearly see that the Gentiles were being grafted into the house of Israel from the very beginning. Most modern-day Christians who only read the back half of the book are shamefully led to believe that the Gentiles were not grafted into the house of Israel until Peter saw the sheet full of unclean animals in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, which we will also look at in just a moment. The stranger mentioned here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 48, once again, just to be clear, is a Gentile. The stranger was someone who was not born into the house of Israel. The stranger was a foreigner or an alien to the house of Israel. And we are clearly told here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 48, that the stranger or the Gentile should be grafted into the house of Israel and keep the Passover to Yahuwah if all of his males were circumcised according to the covenant promise of Abraham. If the Gentile agreed to be circumcised, he was brought into the covenant promise of Abraham. And if he followed the spoken word of Yahovah, then, just as we see in Exodus chapter 12, verse 49, there shall be one law for both the native and for the Gentile stranger who sojourns or travels with the house of Israel. Why? Because he becomes as a native of the land. And so, once again, today's modern-day Christian has no excuse for not keeping this spoken word of Yahovah if they are truly a Christian and they have been grafted into the house of Israel and have become one with our very Jewish Messiah, who was a very Jewish man that came from the body of David, according to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and the tribe of Judah. 
And before we leave Exodus chapter 12, verse 48 and 49, I want us to also highlight the word law found in Exodus chapter 12, verse 49. The word law found in the Old Testament comes from the original Hebrew word Torah, which means instruction. I want you, I want you to see that. We're going to click on this. and We're going to do a little bit of investigative work here. Exodus chapter 12, verse 49. Highlight that word law right there. We're going to go look and see what the original Hebrew was. Let's go to the King James numbered version where we can find that information. Here we find that it is Strong's 88451. Now, if we double click on that and bring our dictionary in, we can see exactly what that Hebrew word is. What is it? It is Torah. When you see law, the law is Torah, my friends. Okay, which is the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Pentateuch. Okay, so which means instruction. Now, what instruction? The instructions that were given to us by the spoken word of Yahovah. In Hebrew culture and in Hebrew society, the words law, word, and Torah are all synonymous and they mean the same thing. The law, the word, and the Torah are all the spoken word of Yahuvah. And Yahuvah is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change. And it is clearly written that Yahuvah proclaims the end from the beginning and not the other way around. And for those modern-day Christians who think that they are not grafted into the house of Israel, I would challenge you to go back and read Romans chapter 11, which we will not do here today for time's sake. But we will very quickly look at Galatians chapter 3, which clearly states that a true believer is indeed the offspring of Abraham and has indeed been grafted into the house of Israel. Again, we can find that very quickly by going to Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 through 29. Again, the New Testament in Galatians says this. Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 through 29. For as many of you as were baptized into the Messiah have put on the Messiah. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in the Messiah, Yeshua. And if, if you are the Messiahs, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise of Abraham. If your denominational country club is teaching and preaching that your denominational country club has replaced the house of Israel, then you need to get up and run, not walk, but run out of that denominational country club. And this is exactly why it is written. And I quote, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped as high as heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. Man has, through the generations, always attempted to overwrite the word of God and to put his own word in place of the word of God. And that's why they don't want you to read the beginning of the book. What we see in Exodus chapter 12 is repeated in even more detail in Numbers chapter 15, verses 14 through 16. Let's take a look at that as well. Very important. It just mirrors what we've already seen. Again, in the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verses 14 through 16, says this, And if a stranger, a Gentile, is sojourning or traveling with you, or anyone is living permanently among you, and he wishes to offer a food offering with a pleasing aroma to Yahuwah, he shall do as you do. For the assembly there shall be one statute for you and for the Gentile who sojourns with you, a statute forever throughout your generations. Highlight that in your Bible, my friends. Numbers chapter 15, verse 15 says, and I quote, for the assembly, and he, now he is again clearly counting not only those who were born by blood into the house of Israel, but the Gentiles who were grafted into the house of Israel as well. He says, for the assembly, all of them, there shall be one statute for you, the native born, and the Gentile who sojourns with you. A statute for how long? Just until my son comes? No. Just until I change my mind? No. 
just until further notice? No. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. And you're going to see that over and over and over again throughout the Torah when you begin to read the book from the beginning, forever and throughout your generations. You and the sojourner Gentile shall be alike before Yahovah. One law and one rule shall be for you and for the Gentile who sojourns with you. Not says I, but says our God breathed scripture. I'd like us to once again highlight Numbers uh, chapter 15, verse 15, where we are told, and I quote, you and the Gentile shall be alike before Yahovah. And please also highlight verse 16, where we are told, and I quote, one law and one rule shall be for uh, you and for the Gentile who travels with you. Once again, here in the Old Testament, just as in the New Testament, in the third chapter of the book of Galatians, there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no Gentile, there is no slave, there is no free, there is not even a male or a female, because we are all one in the eyes of Yahovah. And we are all seen as Abraham's offspring because we have chosen to believe in the spoken word of Yahovah. And I'm sure we all know our Messiah became Ganomi became the spoken word of Yahovah, his father, because he kept and obeyed and loved the spoken word of his father flawlessly, just as we are commanded to keep and to obey and to love the spoken word of his father. My friends, if the spoken word of Yahovah is not written in your heart and in your mind, then you are not a true Christian. Now, I want us to understand this, my friends, because this is extremely important, and this is difficult for many Christians who have not read the beginning of the book to know and to understand. And again, this is not something that I say. This is something that the Scripture says. Let me say this again. If the word of Yahuwah is not written in your heart and in your mind, if you are not trying to understand his spoken word, then you are not a true Christian. If you have thrown his spoken word away, then you are not a true Christian. Most modern-day Christians have no idea what the New Covenant even is. But those of us who read the book from the beginning of the book do know what the New Covenant is, because we have read the whole book and not just half of it. And this is important for us to understand. Let me show you something here, according to Scripture. I want us to read this together. This comes a couple of different Scriptures here, one from the Old Testament, and another from the New Testament, two of them from the New Testament, okay? Let's begin with Jeremiah 31, 33. What does it say here? Again, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahovah. I will put my law within them, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, we find that in Jeremiah chapter 31, 33 in the Old Testament. But we find it again in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 15 through 17. And the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, also bears witness to us for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, them who? Them the house of Israel, who we have been grafted into. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them in their minds. Then, he adds, and I want you to highlight that word, then. Then, he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Are we starting to see the pattern here? And I also want us to turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 20, because our Messiah talks more about this new covenant that Yahovah promised in the book of Jeremiah and again in the book of Hebrews. Luke chapter 22, verse 20 says this, and this is during the last, uh, what many call the Last Supper, which is actually the Passover meal that our Messiah had with his disciples. He says this, and likewise, the cup, he had, they were passing the cup, and after they had eaten, he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What is the new covenant all about? The new covenant is all about God writing his law 
in our hearts and in our minds. Anything here about the law being a curse? Anything here about the law being done away with? Does the Apostle Paul ever say that the law is done away with? No, my friends. No, absolutely not. The Apostle Paul never says that the law is done away with. He says that the curse of the law, which was the ordinance written against us, was moved out of the way. What was the curse of the law? The curse of the law was the penalty for breaking the law, which was death. According to the Scripture, our God-breathed Scripture, Sin is the transgression of the law. And according to our god breathed scripture, the wages of sin is death. Yeshua moved the penalty of the law out of the way so that we could return. He took and paid that death penalty for us by becoming our ransom, our Passover lamb, my friends. It's really not that hard to understand unless you've been duped by sitting in a denominational empire pew for 20 to 30 years. In the beginning of the book, in the Old Testament, Yahuwah makes a new covenant with the house of Israel, who we have already proven that we as true Christians have been grafted into. And that new covenant that Yahuwah makes with the house of Israel promises that he will write his law in our hearts. Nowhere does the New Covenant promise ever tell anyone that his laws will be done away with or that his laws belong only to the Jews. In the back of the book, in the New Testament, we are told the exact same thing that this is once again quoted from the Old Testament. And the author of the book of Hebrews quotes from the book of Jeremiah, as most of the New Testament does. No, over, over probably over about 75% of the New Testament is really nothing but quotes from the Old Testament. But modern-day Christians don't know that because they've been conveniently programmed to only read the back half of the book. You really don't need to read the beginning of the book because they don't want you to know these things. We are told that Yahuwah will put his laws in our hearts and that he would write them in our minds. And then, then, once he writes his laws in our hearts and writes them in our minds, then and only then will he remember our sins and our lawless deeds no more. Not says I, but says our God-breathed scripture that you just got done reading in Hebrews chapter 10. Furthermore, our Messiah tells us very clearly in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, that this new covenant that Yahovah made with the house of Israel was poured out for us in his blood when he was crucified. In other words, if you have the blood of your Messiah over you, then you also have the laws of his Father written in your heart and in your mind. How could you not have his laws written in your heart and your mind after what he did for us? And if you do not have his laws written in your heart and in your mind, then according to Hebrews chapter 10, he has not forgiven your sins and your lawless deeds are still remembered by Yahovah. Only those who have the law of Yahovah written in their hearts and on their minds because of what our Messiah did will have their, sin, their sins and their lawless deeds forgotten by Yahovah, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Once again, not says I, but says our God-breathed scripture. Why is all of this important, and what does all of this have to do with Leviticus chapter 11? The church today wrongfully and shamefully proclaims that the law of Yahovah is a curse and that it has been done away with altogether. By the way, have you ever read Psalms 119? If you haven't, that's your homework for this evening. But we don't find this nonsense of God's law being done away with anywhere within the confines of the 66 books of our Bibles when we read the scripture for ourselves. What we do find is that the penalty of the law, which is death, has been moved out of the way by our Messiah so that we can now return to our Father in heaven in order to have his laws written in our hearts and in our minds. We, just like our Messiah, are commanded to follow our Messiah and to walk as our Messiah walked so that, so that, we can also become the spoken word of God made flesh, just as he was. That's why he wants us to follow him. 
This is why we die by going down into the watery grave of baptism to be raised up a new creature who can keep the laws and the commandments of Yahovah, not because they are works to us, not because we are working to be saved, but because we love him and his laws and his commandments and his precepts are no longer a burden to us. And therefore, if his laws and his commandments and his precepts are no longer a burden to us, how then can they be considered to be works? 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Let's read it together. 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3 says this, The biblical definition of the love of God is found right here. If anybody ever asks you, what's the biblical definition of the love of God? You just turn them to 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. It says this, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do what? And toss away his commandments? No. When we love God and obey his commandments. Here it is, my friend. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Which leads us right back to Leviticus chapter 11 and whether or not all animals are clean and to be considered food for today's modern-day Christian. Clearly, our Father's spoken word, also known as his law and his Torah, tell us that all animals are not to be considered food for today's modern-day Christian. But what does today's modern-day church teach and preach? Today's modern-day church teaches and preaches the direct opposite of the spoken word of the God of Israel. Today's modern-day church ignorantly and shamefully teaches and preaches that all animals are considered good for, any, for, for all good food by God, and that God was only joking when he told us not to eat unclean animals because he is holy and he wants us to be holy. He doesn't want us to be holy anymore. It's okay if you're not holy anymore. Don't worry about it. What makes a person holy? Following the Messiah, walking as he walked, who always ate clean food, my friends, always kept the commandment of his father. The scripture that they oftentimes arrogantly use uh, is found in Acts chapter 10, where Peter has this vision of a sheet of both clean and unclean animals. And just so that we can know exactly what Acts chapter 10 actually does say, and just as importantly, what Acts chapter 10 does not say, let's go read it for ourselves, shall we? Let's turn to Acts chapter 10, verses 131, and let's see if we can find in Acts chapter 10 where it says that all food, all animals are clean to eat. And you can eat anything you want. Where does that? Is that written in Acts chapter 10 like they proclaim that it is? Well, let's go ahead and see. Let's go over here very quickly. We're going to go to Acts chapter 10 here very quickly. We're going to get back here. And we'll move the dictionary out of the way. And I just want to read these few scripture here. Just uh, Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 31. Let's read this story about this sheet that comes down in front of Peter. Starting with Acts chapter 10 verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continuously to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have, been, have ascended as a memorial before God. And now, send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with, with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who had spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry. I want you to highlight that in your Bible, Acts 10.10. What did Peter did become? He became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, Peter fell into a trance, and he saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Peter, Peter, rise 
kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. Now, I want you to also highlight this in Acts chapter 10, verse 17. What does it tell us here? Does it tell us that Peter knew immediately that it was okay to go eat unclean animals? No, it does not. It says that Peter was inwardly perplexed. He still doesn't get it. He still doesn't understand what the vision means. And he won't understand until he arrives at Cornelius' house. So, again, my friends, highlight Acts chapter 17, where it says Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean. In the meantime, here's these two soldiers standing at the gate. And they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, again, because he didn't understand it, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the man and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day they rose and they went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And Peter entered. Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet, and he worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit any one of another nation. But, and I want you to highlight that word, but, in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. We're going to come back to that. But, Peter says, God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when does Peter understand the vision of the, the sheet? of the clean and unclean animals. Right here in Acts chapter 28, when he finally gets to Cornelius, he finally understands that the sheet was all about not calling God's people unclean like some kind of animal. This, my friends, was a law of the Pharisee. It came from what is known as the halakha, the oral law of the Jews that had been handed down from the Jews. Again, it is despotic, demonically inspired. Nowhere in the Bible is it said anywhere that a Jew is a dog or should be treated as an unclean person. A human being, whether he be Jew or whether he be Gentile, is made in the image of God. And so this law, when, when Peter says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation, this was not the law of God. This was the law of the Pharisees. Notice but, that Peter makes a distinction. He says, but... God has shown me that that's wrong and that I should not call any person common or unclean. Now, my friends, I ask you plainly, anything here that says that you can eat an unclean animal? Let's continue on. Acts chapter 10, verse 29. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. And again, then as we continue on, we won't read the rest of the book, the 10th chapter. It's just about Peter telling him about Yeshua and re-solidifying who the Messiah truly is and who the only begotten Son of God, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham actually is. And this is when Cornelius was let in on the whole picture and again, himself, as a Gentile, became grafted into the house of Israel. My friends, these things are not hard to understand if we read them for ourselves instead of letting some huckster stand behind the pulpit tell us what they mean. And so, once again, we have Peter who went up on the housetop to pray, and he became hungry. Now, why do you think he became hungry? 
He became hungry because Yahovah was about to give Peter a vision, and he wanted that vision to be relevant to Peter. And so Peter was hungry, and Yahuwah used Peter's hunger to teach him that Gentiles are not like unclean animals and should not be treated that way. The law that Peter was talking about in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, that says that it was unlawful for a Jew to associate or to visit anyone of another nation, meaning a Gentile, again, was not a law of God. You won't find that in the Torah anywhere. This law was a man-made law that came from the Pharisees who had made void the word of God in order to hold on to their own traditions. Nowhere in the Torah is anyone ever told that they cannot associate or visit a Gentile. Notice here in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, that Peter tells Cornelius that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. And then he uses the word but. Immediately, Peter contrasts the law of the Pharisees with the law of God and realizes that it is the law of God that he should be following. And what he has been taught by the Pharisees is not a law at all. It's just a law of men. It has nothing to do with the law of God. The law of man can never over, overwrite or supersede the law of God. So Peter goes on to say in verse 28 that God had shown him that he should not call any person common or unclean. Now, again, does this say uh, that Peter was told not to call any animals unclean? No. It most assuredly does not. What Yahovah was showing Peter is that the Gentiles were not to be called unclean like unclean animals. This teaching of a, a Gentile man or woman being like an unclean animal originated from the teaching of the Pharisees and their oral law, which is called the Halakha, which had absolutely nothing to do with the law of Yahovah. And there are many Jewish laws uh, that come from this Pharisaical understanding and what is known as Judaism, the religion of Judaism, which is, again, not Christian any more than Catholicism is Christian. Catholicism is not Christianity. Catholicism is just that. It's, it is Catholicism. Christianity is completely different. It is, uh, it is, again, completely opposite of what you find in Catholicism or Judaism. Our Messiah railed against the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23 for making void the word of God in order to hold on to their own tradition. And we see another perfect example of this in Mark chapter 7, verses 6 and 9. Let's go read that for ourselves here very quickly. Again, we're going to go to the New Testament in Mark chapter 7. Let's get over to Mark chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. Red letter words from our Messiah. And he says this, and he said to them, Mark chapter 7, verse 6, and he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? And again, he's talking to the Pharisees here. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What is today's church doing? They are honoring him with their lips, but where's their heart? It is far from them. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. My friends, is there anything different today? Remember, the Pharisees were the pastors of our Messiah's time. They were the pastors and the priests and the uh, popish leaders of his time. And they were the ones who he railed against. Is there any difference in our time? I tell you the truth, my friends, Yeshua HaMashiach, the only begotten son of God, the son of David, the son of Abraham, could be standing in front of 99 and 9 tenths of today's pastors, and they would never know who he was, just like the Pharisees, just like the Pharisees that he stood in front of and never knew who he was. And so, in Acts chapter 10, verse 17, we're told that Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean. He obviously knew that it did not mean that he could eat unclean animals. And this is why Peter was perplexed. Peter knew better than that. He knew better. He knew he could not eat anything uncommon. He knew that was in the Bible. That was the law. Peter knew that there had to be another explanation. Excuse me there for just a minute. My allergies are still trying to play with me here. 
And so Peter finds out that the explanation for the vision of the sheet was later on after he goes to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, where Peter clearly states that God had shown him that he should not call any person common or unclean. And that was the meaning of the vision of the sheet full of unclean animals, clean and unclean animals. Peter's vision of the sheet of both clean and unclean animals was telling Peter not to count the Jew and the Gentile as uh, an unclean animal. The sheet full of both clean and unclean animals was telling Peter not to count the Gentiles who were created in the image of God as unclean. Again, there is nothing, absolutely nothing in Acts chapter 10 that states that a modern-day Christian can now go eat unclean food. Not one word. Now, another common misconception that today's modern-day church uses to try to convince modern-day Christians that they can eat anything that they want to eat is found in Romans 14, verses 1 through 23. In Romans chapter 14, verse 2, Paul says, and I quote, One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. When the Apostle Paul says that one person believes that he may eat anything, Paul is not talking about eating unclean animals. Unclean animals are not food according to Scripture, and Paul, being a Pharisee himself, would have been well aware of this. Clearly, Paul is making a distinction between those who eat meat and those who eat vegetables, which are known as vegetarians. As we continue on through Romans chapter 14, Paul gets into those who fast and those who do not fast at different times because they were arguing about who was fasting and who wasn't fasting. They were arguing about who was eating meat and who is a vegetarian. Paul says in verse 6 that the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains from eating in honor of the Lord gives thanks to God. They both give thanks to God. In Romans chapter 14, verse 20, Paul says, and I quote, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another, anyone else stumble by what he eats. Once again, the Apostle Paul is talking about those who eat meat versus those who eat just vegetables. When Paul says that everything is indeed clean, he's talking about the, in the context of food. Who designates what food is? God designates what food is. Unclean animals are not food. They, cannot, they are not considered in the word everything. Paul was not saying that you could eat an unclean animal any more than Paul was saying that you could eat an end table or a lamp. We certainly would not think that an end table or a lamp was food because Paul said that everything is indeed clean. Paul was not talking about anything designated. Paul was only talking about things that were designated as food by God. That is the context upon which Paul was speaking. Even today in our time, there are Christians who believe that they cannot eat meat, according to the Bible. And Paul was addressing this very objection in Romans chapter 14. Nowhere in Romans chapter 14 is it written that a Christian may eat what God has said is unclean. In fact, the Apostle Paul asks that all-important question in Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Let's go read that very quickly so that we can know uh, who Paul was and what Paul actually taught about the law. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, Paul says. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So clearly, Paul never taught that our faith overthrows the law. The church teaches that, but Paul does not. The truth of the matter is that the Apostle Paul always lived in observance of the law, according to James and the elders in Jerusalem. In the book of Acts, in the 21st chapter, the Apostle Paul comes to visit James and the elders in Jerusalem. And James and the elders in Jerusalem are upset with Paul because many of the Jews in Jerusalem believed in Yeshua. And they believed that Paul was teaching uh, them, the Gentiles, to forsake Moses by telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to their customs. And, and James and the elders in Jerusalem are clearly upset. And so James and the elders come up with a plan. And so James and the elders tell Jer at Jerusalem, tell the Apostle Paul to take four men who are under a Nazarite vow to the temple so that they may offer their sacrifices, which is what you had to do at the end of a Nazarite vow, so that they could shave their heads. Now, the commandment of a Nezerite vow can be found in Numbers chapter 6, 
back in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. That's Numbers chapter 6. If you want to go read about what a Nazarite vow is and what sacrificial offerings had to be made at the end of a Nazarite vow. This is what Paul was doing according to the law. And listen to what James and the elders tell the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 21, verses 23 through 24. Listen closely to this now. Again, Acts chapter 21, verses 23 and 24. Paul, or, or the, James and them, James and the elders tell Paul, Do therefore what we tell you, Paul. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, Paul, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. And so, once again, when we read the beginning of the book, we can clearly see that the beginning of the book explains in great detail what's going on at the end of the book. And we are much less likely to be led astray because we have read what? The beginning of the book. If we don't read the Bible from the beginning, we, mo we will most certainly never be able to understand the end of the book because our Father in heaven does indeed proclaim the end from the beginning and not the other way around. For those who do not read the beginning of the book, they leave themselves wide open for the deception of men who Jude, who was the brother of our Messiah, clearly tells us in the book of Jude, have crept into the body and are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. How do they do that? By overwriting his laws to fit their own will instead of doing the will of the Father. And by doing so, they deny our only Master and Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, who always walked in the way of his Father in heaven. Our Messiah always kept the seventh-day Sabbath of his Father. Our Messiah always kept the feasts and the appointments of his Father. Our Messiah always ate food that was designated by his Father as food. And we as modern-day Christians are commanded to walk in the same way in which he walked. 1 John chapter 2, verses 4 and 7. 1 John chapter 2, verses 4 and 7. 1 John 2, verse 4 says, Whoever says, I know him, talking about the Messiah, whoever says, I know the Messiah, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth isn't even in him. Let's read that again and highlight that in your Bibles, my friends. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar and the truth isn't even in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. What does the church teach today, my friends? Does it teach us to walk in the same way that our Messiah walked, keeping everything that his Father ever commanded, because that's how he walked? No. The church, church teaches us not to walk the way Yeshua walked. John goes on to say, Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment. This is not a new commandment, but an old commandment that you've heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Highlight that, my friends, in your Bible. And yet at the same time, Paul or John goes on to say that it is somewhat of a new commandment because the Messiah has finally come to make these things known to us. But again, my friends, what does the church teach today? The church today teaches the exact opposite of what we read in our God-breathed scripture. The church today teaches us that we should not walk in the same way that our Messiah walked. The church today teaches us that we should not keep the seventh-day Sabbath of his Father. The church today teaches that their Jesus came to create his own first day of the week Sunday Sabbath and to erase the commandment of his Father. The church today teaches that our Jesus, that their Jesus came to celebrate his own birthday. My friends, how many birthdays are there in the Bible? Do you know? There's two. Both of them were pagan kings, and both of them committed murder on their pagan birthdays. 
the birth date of none of the apostles are ever mentioned. The birth date of any of the prophets are not mentioned. The birth date of any of the high priests are not mentioned. The birth date of any of the Levitical priesthood are not mentioned. No one has their birthday mentioned in the Bible, in the 66 books of the Bible, including but not limited to our Messiah. And to lie to your children and say that you know when his birthday is, is nothing short of sin. The church today teaches that there Jesus was crucified on Good Friday, while all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all tell us that our Messiah died on Preparation Day, which is Passover Day, in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Something else that most modern-day Christians have no concept of because they have been conveniently pre-programmed not to read the beginning of the Bible. And the lies and the deception go on and on and on because the first 39 books of the Bible have been conveniently erased according to today's modern-day church who continues to teach the festivals and the holidays and the demonically inspired appointments of her mother church of Rome. My friends, our Father in heaven is pouring out his spirit as we speak. We do not need another revival that continuously regurgitates the same old lies and traditions and denominational dogmas of men and their so-called early church fathers and their prestigious Bible commentators and their rabbinical sages and their so-called holy fathers and their popes. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. Do not think that these people are not alive and well today in our time. We tell you the truth. There are many more of them than there are of us. And this is exactly why it is written that many are called, but only few are chosen. Straight is the gate and narrow is the path, and few there be that find it. Next week, we'll dive farther into Leviticus chapter 11 to see even more biblical truth. But before we close the books today, I'd like to once again ask everyone within the sound of my voice to please, please, my friends, take what you've heard here today to your own prayer closet. Close yourself in, bow your head and bend your knee and face the holy promised land of Jerusalem and ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach if what you have heard here today be true or not. Ask, seek, and knock on his door and on his door alone and the door will be opened to you. And if you would do that, and if you would stay the course to the end, you and I will surely walk through the gates of his soon coming kingdom together. I'm Pastor Scott Villain with Holy Impact Ministries. And once again, I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to once again minister to you and to teach you what has been taught to me. And again, I challenge you to take these things to your prayer closet and test them through the fire of prayer, as we should do all things that we hear from all people. It is he that is the master, and it is his discernment that we must have. With that being said, I'd like to say a quick prayer over all of us before we leave. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father, blessed and holy is your name, high and far above all, all names. We thank you, Father, for your mercy and for your grace. We thank you for the blood that covers our heads. We thank you, Father, for the discernment that you've given us. We thank you for pouring out your spirit upon your people in these last days. We thank you, Father, for helping us to question these things, to test the fruits of those who teach. Help us, Father, to be able to navigate through the deception of these days that is so thick that it is like pea soup. Help us, Father, as our adversary runs roughshod across the face of the earth, trying to deceive not only us, but our children and our children's children. Help us to know what the truth is. And then give us your Ruach Hukadesh that helps us to have the drive to want to know more and to understand more, but more importantly, to do more. 
In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray, Father, that you would bless each and every soul within the sound of my voice, those who agree and even those who do not, as they journey on their journey to the same place that we are all headed. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we praise your holy name high and far above all, all names. I ask, Father, that your face would shine upon each and every single solitary person that is within the sound of my voice until we meet again. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we ask these things. Once again, my friends, I just want to say thank you so very much. It has been a huge blessing to be able to be with you this Tuesday. I know we ran a little bit long in the tooth here uh, this evening. I did want to say once again, uh, thank you to all of our Patreon supporters and, and all of our PayPal supporters. God bless you. Thank you so very much. Uh, if you found these teachings uh, helpful in any way, if you found that these teachings help you, if you found anything to take to your prayer closet, and test through the fire of prayer. We would ask that you might visit us over at Holy Impact Ministries. And if we have been a blessing to you, we would simply ask that you also would be a blessing. You can visit us at our uh, front webpage. You can become a Patreon there. Uh, and you can also donate here through PayPal. Uh, or you can also send by snail mail, whichever way you'd like to do that. Again, we do not sell the Word of God at Holy Impact Ministries. The only income that we have to keep us on the air and to keep us afloat and moving forward is from the offerings, the free will offerings of our brothers and sisters. And so once again, uh, if you would do that, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. And we will see you this next coming seventh day Sabbath at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Shalom, everybody.